Hello and welcome to another episode of Addicted to Business. Today we're delighted to be joined by Steve Stobald from White Cobalt. Hello, Steve. Hello. And also my fellow co-host and good friend, Mr. Stokely Howard. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Very well. Good. So, Steve, thank you for joining us all the way from sunny London. Was it sunny this morning? No, it was pissing down. <laughs> all the way from pissing down London. Welcome to the UK. <laughs> So, no, I wanted to talk today around digital transformation. So I've had the pleasure of knowing you now for at least 12 months. And one thing that's always struck me is your approach to digital transformation. And we've always had conversations about how you guys specialized in more back-end digital transformation. Yeah. And we do more front-end digital transformation. So you guys are essentially improving maybe profitability or efficiency or whatever. But I think it's fair to say maybe not often getting the plaudits because it's the stuff that people, customers, can't see, right? Or wouldn't notice maybe if they did. There we yeah. go. So before we dive into all that good stuff, tell us a little bit more about White Cobalt and how he got started. Okay, so ten years old now. At the end of at the end of January. So that's your uh, business, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not your age. <laughs> R- running a business ages you, but not quite that quickly. <laughs> no, ten years old. Uh, the company. Um, before that, I was a software developer and CTO. So I come. I came from the technical technical background from the technical side mm. um pretty much got fed up with working for other people wasn't particularly good at the politics in in, in a business anyway and decided i'd rather run my own shop uh, started the company like i said 10 years ago um really looking to take some of that big company thinking and bring it to a smaller market so you know what we would define as digital transformation which i think is a little different to to what you would call sure it, um you know, it's something that big businesses have been doing for decades in varying forms because up until recently, they're the only ones who could afford it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that sort of thinking of, of utilizing technology to um, replace or, or to uh, leverage their human resources more effectively is something that's quite commonplace in big businesses but doesn't really uh, perforate into the smaller companies that are out there. So really, the the stated goal of the company was to bring that kind of thinking to a smaller smaller audience to help them understand how technology can be utilised to move their business to the next level. Can help them, yes, with efficiency, yes, with profitability, but also scaling, also okay. helping them grow. Um, and that and that's really where it becomes very very powerful is when we get into to that kind of area. Um, and so we started the company, you know, White Cobalt became and, and we've been going for, like I said, yeah, for 10 years. I've said that about three times now. The sole fa- uh, you're the sole founder? going for, yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years. Um, yes, just me. Yeah. Okay. So it's my company. Um, I did have a business partner at one point uh, along the way, but not at the beginning and not now. Sure. Um, it's been a long and at times lonely journey. Yep. You know, anybody out there who runs a business will probably empathize with that. Absolutely yourself. right. Yeah. Especially by yourself. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I, one of the things that we've done a lot of in recent years is um, kind of peer learning programs where I'm working with other business owners and, and we're all trying to learn from each other because that's in fact we're doing it this evening. We after, are indeed. After the podcast. Yeah. So, um, you know, because I think that's that's a really important thing when you run a business. No, no one is born knowing how to run a company and being able to pull on the experience of other entrepreneurs is actually very, very powerful on your journey. Definitely. So that kind of brings us almost up to today. Yeah. You're doing this day to day. You're solving, essentially going into businesses, solving their challenges and headaches, as many of us uh, strive to do. 10 years is a long time. Tell me about it. <laughs> what would you I'm say? I'm 23 years old. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? It's a real tough paper round. <laughs> what would you say are the real key learnings you've taken from it? And one of those perfectly evident so was, was peer-to-peer learning, and, and that's yeah, actually definitely. how we met yep. um, through one of Martin Zeman's dinners. But actually, what else is a, uh, if you could go back 10 years, what are the kind of things you've really learned that you think, Christ, that's invaluable? Oh, if I, if I could talk to myself 10 years ago... Um, get out your own way. I would love to be flying that wall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that—that that was the big one for me. Um, you know, we all have our baggage. We all have things that we carry with us from life and from from our experiences. Um, and I think a lot of the time, you you know, I, certainly I went into a business with a very clear idea about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to be different from other companies around me. And I feel like maybe in retrospect 
I was too quick to dismiss why those companies were like that. Okay. Um, you know, I was too quick to think that I knew better when actually they had perhaps just gone further in their journey and had learned things that I hadn't. Yep. Um, it isn't always a good thing to break the mold. You know, some, sometimes the mold exists that way for a reason and it's the product of, of, of that learning and it's the product of that experience that someone's gone through. And I think the peer learning thing has, yeah, has really helped me with that yep. as well. So, um, yeah, the, but the biggest thing definitely is, you know, understanding what my hang-ups were about things when I was just getting in my own way. Mm. And, uh, Tess, if you don't mind, but would you mind sharing some of those? Um, yeah, I mean... There, there are two key things that really held me back in the early years. One was trusting other people. Yeah. So having employees. Letting go. Which, le- letting that's the thing yeah. which I'm sure many listeners and watchers oh, will have exactly the same issue. I right? mean, and funnily enough, part of what we do helps them with that because we're putting in place systems that allow your team to be more in control or allows you to be more in control of your team. Yeah. Stops them from getting off the rails so much, allows you to do more with less people. So we can sort of minimize that to a degree. How's that for a plug? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right now. <laughs> but, but also, yeah, no, anybody who runs a business will, will have faced the challenges of trying to find good people and trying to find and then keep them when they have, it, when they have them and train them and get them pointing in, in the right direction. So, you know, that was a big thing for me, you know, learning to trust other people, learning that they may not do things in quite the same way as I would have done them, but mm, a if real the tough lesson to learn. End product is good enough yep. or, or, or fulfills the requirements, then that's a success. You know, yep. I'm a bit of a perfectionist like a lot of business owners. Yeah, so, yeah. So that was a big one, really learning, you know, how to do that, how to hire people, what to look for. You know, mm. starting I, one big lesson I learned was hiring on values rather than hiring on skills. Yep. Mm. Um, you can teach people skills. You can't change their values. And, and that makes, you know, a really big difference with mm. the organizational health and the culture of the business as, as you progress and as you start looking for leaders in your organization at different levels. Having, someone, having people with aligned values to you makes a huge difference. So definitely that would, would be a big lesson. Uh, and the other one was about money. You know, there comes a point in any business where you need other people's money in some <laughs> capacity, whether it's borrowing from the bank, whether it's an overdraft, whether it's mm. credit cards, whether it's external investment, VCs, private equity, whatever it may be. Clients just paying partners, their bills. Client, well, that, that, that always helps. <laughs> a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I, I had a lot of hang-ups about debt. Yeah, uh, and in particular, and so I probably stunted the growth of my business at various points by wanting to cash flow everything mm. and not borrow money. And you know, we've always been very good that we, you know, we pay bills pretty much the day they come in. Yeah, you know, we don't take credit with our suppliers at all. I think that that's that's a very good way to do business. It might take us a few days to process it or something. Sure. But generally speaking, if we get a bill in, unless there's a reason why we're not paying it, because they haven't done the work or something, yeah, then yeah. we're going to pay it pretty quickly. So I always know that we're up to date with everything. And, and you know, now as we've got to the size we have, it's it's become impossible for us to, to reach that size and to grow without some form of credit facility for various things. Yeah. So we're very sensible about how we do it, but it took me a long time mentally for me to be okay with that. There's a stigma around it, right? Like a lot well, of people have a hang up around debt and the negative connotations rather than yeah. it being a tool to accelerate growth. Definitely. It's it's seen as, as something negative. And I, I mean I wish I could tell you that it was, you know, a pragmatic hang up about, you know, not about I mean definitely don't be foolish with borrowing money at all because you course. destroy your business. Borrow within quickly. your means, right? Yeah, exactly. But actually it was just an emotional thing for me that I just didn't want to borrow money. Yeah, which which is quite understandable. But now so the story's incredible where you've come, and it's great that, that Y Cobot continues to go from strength to strength. But actually, today I want to talk more about digital transformation, okay. and but in your world of digital transformation, not mine. Yes. So actually, your world of digital transformation, to the listeners and watchers today, how in, um, and I say this without trying to be patronizing, but no, so no. I can understand as well, in, in simple English, <laughs> what is your world of digital transformation? What is it that you do? So at its fundamental core we are looking at ways that you can apply technology to a business to do one of two things either improve its efficiency so it produces more profit or help it grow and generally both actually so 
when we talk about digital transformation, you know, you're looking at it in terms of digital marketing and in terms of using technology to help people generate more leads, to generate more revenue by getting more in the top. We are looking at it from the perspective of once you have that customer on board, from that point forward until you are no longer doing business with that customer, the entire operational process of your business, how can we transform that using technology? So it's very much an after-sales process, although we will perhaps get involved with sure. with, with pre-sales as, as well. Yeah, um, it's very much operations focused. So it's it's about and it, and it manifests itself as bespoke software. You know, okay. fundamentally, it, there may be some hardware in there. There might be an app. There might be something like that. But generally speaking, it is building a piece of software around your business, mm. building it specifically to your business so that it's not compromised by design by having to deal with things that you don't deal with and, and allows you to take advantage of uh, the power of a computer to do work that previously you've probably had, have, you have probably had done by a member of your staff. So this is gonna be an interesting journey that we're about to go on. So I know that the really nice conversation I had with you before was around if you're using like one or more spreadsheets, yes. then it's time to have a conversation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Spreadsheets have their place, don't Absolutely. get me wrong. Absolutely. But um, you know, if you have four or five, six, ten spreadsheets that are running your business, that is a, a symptom that the software you have is not fulfilling everything that it needs to do. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to sit here and knock off-the-shelf software because it has a purpose and it sure. gets you to a certain stage. When you are working um, you know, as a small and growing business, off-the-shelf software like HubSpot and Insightly and Zero yeah, yeah. And, and Asana mm. and Toggle and all the things that you may go out there and, mm. and, and buy, they're very, very powerful for the money you pay for them. Yeah, And they will get you from zero, no pun intended with zero, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they will get you from the beginning. Not. <laughs> yeah, get, get, get from the beginning to you know, a pretty advanced point. Yeah. But what tends to happen is, they're because by design, they're built for an entire industry not for a company mm. there's a limit to how they're not very specific, very specific. for the business exactly there's a yeah. limit to how much you can do which causes compromise i guess in terms of it can do x y and z but if you want to do a b and c we'll have to just use another system well, or do something else i mean yeah absolutely so i mean one of the things that you'll find is when you have a piece of off-the-shelf software, whatever it may be, and let's use Zero as an example because yep. I think it's, a, it's a very commonly used one and it's a very good. It's a very we'll get good them to sponsor software. this podcast. So yep. great, yeah. <laughs> QuickBooks is also available. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get them to sponsor this podcast. <laughs> We're not the BBC. Not, okay, okay. Okay. Other accounting systems are available. <laughs> um, no, uh, you will be using it in your business, but the person who is doing that, whether they're a bookkeeper or your finance director or you as a small business owner is often the case, they, are, they have to have a certain amount of skill in how to use that software. So it's a tool and you are training them to use it in the way that you want them to do it. Yeah, Because it's so, ge so generalist, it could be used 10 different ways. The same is true of any CRM system you have. Mm. You will use HubSpot or you will use Insightly in the way that's right for your business. What we're looking to do is drive the process the other way around. So we're saying, actually, we're putting in place a piece of software that's smart enough that instead of you needing a skilled user, the software is almost guiding the user on how you guys operate. Mm. So as you grow as a business and you, you face that challenge we talked about earlier on about hiring more and more people, and you might get lucky in the early few months and be able to hire three or four people who are absolutely exceptional and, and, and you know, take your business forward to the next level, you're never going to be able to hire 30 of them and exactly you're certainly right. not going to hire Straight away. 300. <laughs> yeah. No, like there just aren't that many exceptional people out there. You're going to need to be able to hire people who are relatively lower skilled and hire them in greater numbers in order for your business to be able to grow. So by encapsulating the essence of your what we call your business logic, literally the the processes that your business operates on in the software, you can bring in a lower skilled, and that also means cheaper workforce, yep. and have confidence that they will execute what you need them to at the level that you want them to and to the quality that you want them to mm -hmm. so that you're not letting your customers down as you grow. And ultimately that maximizes efficiency and profitability. Absolutely, I mean, w when we talk about, you know, putting these systems in place. I mean, a lot of the time it's not actually about profitability. Mm. 
it is an investment. It mm. takes, um, you know, it takes quite a lot to get these systems up and running, and you need yeah. a business that's reached a certain size before it makes any sense. Because yeah. otherwise, you might as well just stay with your Excel spreadsheets and yeah. your off-the-shelf software. Um, so, to get a return on that investment, you pr obviously want to see an improvement in profitability <laughs> yeah. on some level. Otherwise, it makes no sense. But actually, what we tend to see is businesses reach a point where they can't scale any further. Mm. It doesn't matter how many new customers they get in, doesn't matter how much money they spend on their marketing, doesn't matter how many new people they bring in, they can't continue to achieve the growth rate that they did in their early years. Yeah, And it's because the systems that they have in place are not set up to allow them to scale. Little things like not having all the information in one place, mm. you know, not being able to report on something in real time without needing huge amounts of admin to produce the report. Yep. Stuff like this. All this kind of thing holds a business back. Mm. So when we're putting these you know, software systems in place, that's what we're looking at, as we're actually looking at, as much as anything, taking obstacles out the way to help these businesses move on to the next level. So let's take it to a real world example. And one of the ones we talked about before was almost like a an outdoor caterer style thing. And you were saying you can build systems. So the classic example was Stoke and I went for dinner last night. And we went to a very well-known chain, and mm -hmm. which isn't sponsoring this podcast. Which isn't sponsoring this podcast, certainly not. <laughs> and they um, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not. And, and they, um, despite me going there almost every week, and they, um, they didn't have anything in stock, like nothing, yeah. nothing. And I was like, okay, what about this? What about this? we? We were there for 10, 20 minutes trying to find something they actually had, and at the end it's we just said, why don't you just tell us what you've got, uh, and then we'll choose from that. But there's more than one restaurant in Norwich. So right. <laughs> we could have up sticks and left, but I'm also a creature of habit. I mean, it was a genuine question. I don't know. <laughs> there is actually more than one restaurant, yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, the type of stuff you've been doing would solve that exact problem, right? In terms of stock levels and saying, actually, yes, you're getting absolutely. low on these, let's top these up, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's because it's taking the human element out of the equation. So when, mm. when once you have a system in place and it has to reach a certain size before this starts to take effect, the system actually knows probably more about what your business is doing than any one individual. So you're no longer relying on a human having to remember to check the stock levels, having to remember to- Order, order the chili squid. Or, or, order the chili squid or whatever <laughs> yeah. it may be. It's smart, um, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, It's either doing it for you, and that's when we get into the areas of automation. So yeah. we set rules up that say if you, you know, if you're a if you're a restaurant chain and and you know you're running below a certain level on this product, just automatically order it from the supplier. Yeah. Don't yeah. even have a human element in it. Just you know you know you're going to buy it from that supplier. <laughs> you know you've got an agreed price. You know what it's going to cost you. So let's just send the email out that says please deliver 515 mushrooms to us tomorrow morning. Yep. When the bill comes in and we put it straight into your accounting system and there's no human action involved in it. But it's more important that it happens necessarily than it happens automatically. Mm. Yeah. So that you're not letting your customers down. So, I mean, that's a very, you know, good real-world example. Yeah. Um, there are kind of sort of three different areas that we like to focus on when we're, when we're building these systems. One is that automation that I talked about where, you know, you're actually taking the human step out of the equation entirely. And we are, you know, getting these things to happen based on logic that's defined by the business, obviously. It's not, you know, it's not sure. going to be smart and try and do things on its own. It's ultimately come from mm. the business leader. Uh, the second is um, what we call management by exception, which is when you have you know a normal job that goes through your business, whatever your business is, unless it falls into some category that makes it exceptional, makes it different from the norm, it should not require managerial oversight. It should be able to be dealt with by the core of your team and um, probably the systems that you have in place. Yeah. So for you, it might be building a website that's you know I, I'm not going to try and pretend I understand no, no, what goes sure. on in your yep. business, but um, you know, that kind of thing. And then what we're actually looking for in the system then is, well, what if it is an exception? First of all, what defines an exception? So mm -hmm. uh, a, a good example would be uh, ac accounts payable. So when you've got invoices coming in that you need to pay for your paying suppliers, you may have a set of rules built into the system that define what can go through without managerial oversight. So an, an invoice that is below a certain level or is within X percentage of the quote that you got in the first place can just go straight through and you don't require any kind of management input. If it does require management input, if, it's, if it is an exception, we are putting in place controls that ensure that it is actually checked by a manager. 
and that's two things. One, it will stop whoever it is that's putting it through from progressing past a certain point yep. until it's been approved, perhaps by yourself. Some verification or process, verification. Where, yeah. And secondly, we're making sure the manager knows that by either whether it's an email or a to-do yeah, list SMS or, or something whatever it's gonna like be. that. So, yep. so you're not relying on the human, one, to make sure that it gets a managerial check and two, to remind the manager to do it. The system is doing that for you. And that actually builds quite a lot of efficiency into it because your managers are not having to go hunting through every single item that's coming through to check to see if they need to Absolutely. have an oversight. They're just being presented with a list that they can work from. So let's water it down and let's say, okay, we're talking to a business now. It's not ready for white cobalt. Yep. Right, they just they just haven't got the budget them, and that's absolutely fine. And one day they will, and we've heard all the benefits of why working with you would be amazing. Yep. Where do you start in terms of getting your ops in order? That's a big question. A very big question. I'm yeah. sure a podcast in itself, but yeah. actually more around digital transfer. Basically, how can you do a very basic digital transformation? Well, is what I'm trying to get I mean, at. The first thing that I would, I can talk about how we would approach a project. And there, and there are some projects that we begin and then that becomes apparent that then sure. they're not ready for it yet i mean the first thing is don't be thinking about software if, and, and if you're talking to anybody about this kind of thing and the conversation becomes about software early on walk away yeah it has to be commercially relevant it has to be about where your business is going mm. so when i sit down with a customer to begin with the first question i want the first question i want an answer to is where do you want to be in three years or where do you want to be in five years they've got to have a problem i guess Oh, they'll definitely have a problem, yeah. trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's more about, you know, where is the business going? Yeah. You know, th there are a lot of bits of software out there that you can buy that have a purpose that, that, that the software is defined to fulfill, but that mm. doesn't mean that it's right for you. It doesn't mean it's right for your business. I would always want to link technology back to the commercial reality of what's going on in the business. Mm -hmm. If we can't see a return on investment, in a sensible time frame for the customer, then they shouldn't be doing it. So building a business case, looking at the goals and working backwards. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, building on from there. So yeah. we've created I a goal. No, you're fine. We've created a goal <laughs> yeah. and we've decided, okay, this is where we want to be in three, five years time. Yeah. Then, then what? Well, what we would do then is we would work with the company to figure out a roadmap for that. Okay. So any digital transformation, I mean, any transformation is, is substantial in its, its undertaking. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And you've also got to get the people on board with it as well. A software in itself is never going to solve anything. It yeah. has to be a solution that the whole business is behind. So we would ordinarily m map out for them a plan that would last between two and three years of each stage that we see is, is relevant to transforming their business starting with the most critical and in some instances starting with the thing that we need to get the data to do the next thing yeah and we will b build that roadmap with them uh, you know looking into the future to say we will do one piece and then the next and then the next and then so, so on. everything's phased almost in, in absolutely what we would call sprints yes yeah yeah except think of sprints as being three or six months rather than three or six weeks sure because it's not really about the software development it's about the transition the change management within the business okay so uh one thing you'll hear me talk about a lot is um implementation trauma you know the disruption to the business that happens when you change your systems that's a nice phrase actually and something that everyone should be aware of is when you go through any change is going to be implementation trauma yes um but actually how can people negate well i guess you'll never negate it entirely but no. being prepared for it to know okay we won't take on as much volume of work as we normally would because we're factoring in some well, kind of change. I, I think if you're changing how much work you're taking on we've probably failed somewhere sure um it's more a case of understanding that the business is is and must continue to function while we're doing this so and, and this is really where the virtues of kind of bespoke software come in over anything that's off the shelf you're very limited in what you can do with off-the-shelf software in, in transition. Mm -hmm. One day you're using one system, the next day you're using the other, and you'll probably use mm -hmm. them both for a while, but that's yep. going to cause a huge amount of disruption. Sorry, and it's very it's not efficient as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not at all. Um, whereas when you're building your own systems and we're able to be in control of both what the systems do and the plan to migrate them, we're able to bring them in progressively. So you can have two systems working in parallel, but they're talking to each other. So you can minimize that disruption to the team. But 
the second thing I would say is make sure that the team is on board. You know, as part of any any process, we will start by engaging the, the company for a degree of consultancy okay. to begin with before we go anywhere near writing software because actually the difference between success and failure is not about the software. It's about making sure it's aligned with what that business needs. So anybody looking to go through a transformation project with you, with us, with anybody, it would be get the team involved. Very much so. Challenge on that in terms of, of course, they don't hold the, the purse strings necessarily and sometimes sure. getting the team involved, oh, it would be wonderful. Yeah, crumbs, it would be lovely if we could do that, but that's £500,000 worth of development and we've got a 50k budget. Like. Yeah, I mean, there's always an element of that, sure. for sure. And But that's also why we do that consultancy phase because that's where we shake that stuff out. Uh, yeah, and just manage expectations, I guess. Yeah, I guess. And, mm. and also, you know, looking at where the ROI is and where it's not. And it might be that one day that £500,000 thing does make sense. It just doesn't make sense today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's more about getting buy-in. So th there are two parts to engage, engaging the team. One is getting them on board with the fact that we are doing this and yep. the fact that they are involved in it and, and, and are having a say, which makes them a lot more understanding when that change inevitably happens. They're a lot more supportive, which means the project's got a, a far greater likelihood of success. And the second part, which a lot of people might not want to hear, is actually the people who aren't in the director's office are generally the ones that know what's really going on. That's exactly right. And you know, we've had a couple of instances over the years where you know these lessons were learnt for us where we took too much gospel on the management's interpretation of what was going on. <laughs> the perfect uh, business. The perfect right? business, exactly. And then, <laughs> and, and then when we come to implementation and we start talking to the people on the front lines, the people yep. who are talking to the customers, the people who are doing the actual work, we find that you know, the ideal world is, does not match up with the reality of what's going on. So by getting everybody in the, uh, in the team involved, we can mitigate that. Is there a business principle there to take away from digital transformation but just in any change is that the, it's so important to get multiple perspectives from those on the shop floor from those um in accounts from those looking after ops from those in sales I, and marketing yes because actually while you may be solving a problem here you may be causing a problem over here uh, completely um, and i think what you're touching on there is one of the biggest challenges any business owner will face um you know getting an organization all pointing in the same direction working as a genuine team, and by that I don't mean a bunch of people who come to the same office, I mean people who are truly cooperating with each other, truly crossing the divides from different disciplines, from operations and finance and sales to make sure that they're all actually pulling together and pulling in the same direction, is one of the biggest challenges I think any business owner will face. I think very few businesses I've ever come across have done it successfully. We've done a few things internally that we try and um, you know, to try and help with that. There are a few things in the way that I've set up my business that have helped significantly. Um, it's a particular, um, oh, I was about to say hobby, but that would make it sound unprofessional. No, it's, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's something that I'm very interested in, is, is, you know, the architecture of leadership, how you can put a business together in a way that creates a, a truly cohesive team is something that I've always been very interested in because it's a big part of why I run the business. You know, I want my team to be a family. I want it to be a great place to work. I want people to come, want to come to work every day because I have to work there too. So this takes us perfectly onto the next point, which is around focus. So you clearly have an entrepreneurial mindset. You clearly have a great skill set. And those two together means that, I, and I'd like to think, because I tend to have a similar train of thought, that you can go and do any other business. I hope so, and, so I'm and I'm trying to. So <laughs> There we go. So yeah. how do you balance trying to do many other things with focusing and not neglecting the business that has got you this far? Well, you can only do so much yourself, and yep. that really comes down to your team. So one of the things that I'm, I'm very much an advocate of is I want leaders at every level. And mm. if you have leaders at every level in the business and, and you empower them to lead, then it more and more... You, you basically get greater and greater scalability within the organization. Uh, the other thing that we've done, and this is one of the things I was, I was referring to just now, is most businesses will have some form of organizational chart. They will have, a, or looks like a pyramid generally, yep. Nathan at the top, you know, senior management. If only. If only. <laughs> <laughs> Near the top. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, I find that that tends to lead to... Um, it tends to lead to a particular mindset from the people in the organization that those at the top are there to instruct 
and command in, in, in perhaps a slightly sort of militaristic way those that are be- lower than them on the organisational chart. Um, and it often correlates as well generally with compensation and a few other bits sure. and pieces as well and seniority and, and yep. uh, experience. Where actually our organisational chart is drawn the other way up. It's an inverted pyramid. So I am at the bottom because my job is to support my management team. So the next layer in the business, the, the, the senior management team, my job is to support them so that they can support the layer above them, which mm. is the front lines in the mm. case of my yeah. business, the people who actually help the customers. And then at the very top of the chart is a big cloud filled with our customers. So because that's a phenomenal model. It's a very simple shift. It's just turning the thing upside down, but psychologically, it changes everyone's mindset. Where mm. did you learn that model? I came up with it. I was I w- say, I've not read that or no, seen no, that no, or I, heard I, of that. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's the product of, uh, I, I, as, I, as you know, I read a great deal. Yeah, and absolutely. It's, it's the product of lots of lessons from lots of different books. But it was I originally wanted to make it a sphere, actually, because you can remove the core from a sphere and it still remains its structural integrity, but it's quite hard to draw. So, <laughs> <laughs> so an upside-down so triangle So we made better. an upside-down triangle <laughs> because it was a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so... and Because and and that's actually what my job is. My job is to hire the best people I possibly can and then support them in achieving their goals so that they can go on to support our customers. Sure. The other thing that I see a lot of businesses do, which I think is misguided is perhaps the best way is they divide their team and their uh, and their organization on the basis of different skill sets so you have a finance department you have mm-hmm. an operations department you have a sales department you have an hr department swim lanes we call them swim lanes yep. yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely and and what that does is it creates silos of people who don't necessarily have relationships with people outside of those departments and that inevitably will create competition now, competition's good, but you want to be competing with people outside the organization, not people inside the organization. Correct. Yes. So, you know, there are a number of different strategies to mitigating that. One is draw your um, t- team divides the other way, draw them horizontally rather than vertically. So you have small business units that may have one person from finance, one person from ops, one person uh, from pods sales. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and change them up on a regular basis so that people can maintain relationships from from one area to another sure. otherwise they get you just cliques and stuff like that yeah, yeah absolutely and the other thing is you know you can do an awful lot with a seating plan you know just getting people sitting around different people in the office because when people have real relationships and you know we talk a lot about bringing your whole self to work and we are all human beings and we all yeah. have you know lives outside work and emotions and good days and bad days and it's when those relationships become real in the office that a real team forms it's when a team has the the, the confidence to be vulnerable with each other and accept that you know what they messed up sure and and can someone help me fix it please yeah. and, that it's okay things to, before, and that it's okay yeah i mean i'm probably the most um you know prolific user of the words i don't know or i fucked up yeah sorry yeah yeah we didn't talk about that before we started um, <laughs> you know because um you know that's actually me saying there are people out there that know better than i do and i want them to try and help me fix this. If I can't accept that I've made a mistake, or if I mm. can't accept that I don't know anything, then I'm ultimately going to be the limiting factor in this business. And this I did read in a book, although I can't for the life remember which one. Uh, it might have been one by Simon Sinek. Um, basically where it said the ultimate limiting factor in the growth of any business beyond a certain point. Actually, no, let me, sorry, let me quote this correctly because that wasn't right. What it said was, there comes a point in any business where its continued growth is directly correlated to the personal development of the guy who owns it, or person who owns it, yeah, yeah. sorry. And I've seen it in practice. So we had uh, mm. a customer of ours, uh, their business failed, unfortunately, um, and it didn't, I'm not gonna name them, obviously, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> shame, shame. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, when I, when I sort of look back on it and I, and I, you know, look at what caused that business to go down, the business had, had reached a size where the people who were running it probably should have brought someone in with more experience or should have inve- or could have invested <laughs> more in their own development and then the business perhaps wouldn't have, wouldn't have had so many problems. Sure. 
Um, no, I mean that sounds like a criticism, but it's well, no, it probably is. But you know, it, it's a it, learning, I guess. A le- le- yeah. yeah, an opportunity mm. to learn, and you know, feedback. Yeah, <laughs> but like we hate that word, don't <laughs> we? <laughs> feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, you know, I think that's really, really important in a business that you know. No, I said earlier on, no one's born knowing how to run a company. You know, you have to invest in yourself. You have to invest in, you know, your skill set. Um, that often doesn't look necessarily like people think it does. And it doesn't mean going and doing an MBA, although I am doing an MBA and I would recommend it to anybody. But, you know, it's where, also about... Where do you find the time? Oh. You just That's one thing you've actually been very good at, actually, is continuing to develop yourself as well as the business. And whenever I yeah. we do catch up, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm reading these books or I'm following this series or I'm speaking to this person or I'm yeah. studying this degree or whatever it is. I mean, that's... That's yeah. a great trait for anyone to take from totally. And, and funnily enough, the MBA is actually a bit of an indulgence for me, okay? Because I basically get to spend three days every month just going to university and talking about my favourite subject, which is running businesses. Yeah. So <laughs> it's actually almost like a little bit of a holiday, and I don't have to do any work. <laughs> well, uh, um, but um, you know, but it, you know, a lot of the time that learning comes in different forms. It's the peer learning things that we've sure. talked about. It's you know, I, I probably rip through a book every two weeks, you know, and, I, and I've and I've got as many books on my shelf that I want to read as books that I have read. So, um, and being able to digest that information and then apply it and understand how it can actually make a practical difference is, you know, is really the essence of, of, of how you learn and how you grow as, as a business leader. I think peer-to-peer learning, mastermind groups, all those good things where essentially you get like-minded individuals in a room, Chatham House rules, as we'll be doing tonight, yep. it is absolutely invaluable and definitely the way for anyone watching or listening that's looking to to grow and progress both themselves and their business, definitely look into those kind of definitely. mastermind opportunities. Yeah, and just there. leave your ego at the door. Uh, that's the thing, right? I actually, mean, actually, and, that's a good thing in, in any yeah. in any business context. Yeah. yeah, leave your ego at the door because all it's going to do is get in your way. Yeah, this yeah. is it. And actually, being and honest, your pride open as well. Tra- I think yeah, sometimes yeah. honest, open, and transparent. And actually, that's one thing from Martin Zeman's dinners that we've learned is actually maybe yeah, we should get him to sponsor this podcast. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> that's two times now, Martin <laughs> Zeman. <laughs> no, but that's actually, three. if you um, if you go in and and try and feint a pol- false picture, the only person you're cheating or kidding is yourself. Yes, you're you're investing your own time and your own money to be there. Yeah. So why on earth not seek opinions? And actually, so but it's hard. It is hard. It is hard. But like, also, the people there are in different sectors and and have different journeys and skill sets. Yes. And actually, therefore, it's so much more valuable. So there's peer to peer learning within your own sector, and I do lots of agency to agency learning, and that's great. But actually, sometimes to talk to someone that's grown a, a chocolate making business, and someone over here that's been in sales coaching forever, and someone over here that's, that's in like hair product and then software, and it's, yeah. it's like that's unbelievable because their external perspective is is sometimes eye opening and slightly alarming. You go, how did I not see that? Yeah, and and you know, one of the things I love about my business is I get to see under the hood of everybody else's business. Because you know we, we have to have full transparency to be able to do what we do, and if there's one thing that I've probably learned from doing that, it's that at the level that we're playing at in the SME space, eighty percent of all businesses are the same. So you may very well be in marketing, I might very well be in software, somebody else might be making chocolate. That that's the twenty percent that differentiates us is what they actually do. The other eighty percent of the problems they face are all exactly the same. You know much. where this is going. Roughly, what are the headlines that make them? Say, is it like similar sales and marketing challenges in terms of lead gen, yeah, similar or HR, challenges or find, people. finding people, yeah. cash flow financing, mm. whatever it is, yeah. software systems that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. You know, and that's why you know we often get asked, you know, are there any particular sectors that that we specialize in? And I wish I could say yes because. It would make our marketing a lot easier yeah, for starters. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but the truth is, we can help most businesses, and, and I quite like the challenge of going into somewhere a new sector, something I've not, you know, explored before, and, and understanding how that area works, and being able to put my brain into into gear, and and, and figuring out how we can help them by using technology. Sure. Um, and that's perhaps slightly selfish of me to do that. I don't know, but I'm going to keep doing it. No, keep going. <laughs> so yeah, just to summarise. If there's one thing people can take from your business journey and your business time, what is it? What is one thing that people can take away from today and go and implement tomorrow? Leave your ego at the door. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Leave your ego at the door. With it's, all just, it's just holding you back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that's really important. Uh, and we're going to leave it there. So, Steve, thank you so much for having right. Thank My you. My pleasure. I really appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. 
Thank uh, you. As always, uh, if you'd like to find out more about Steve and what he does and, and, and kind of reach out to him about his journey, how is best to get in touch with you? Uh, give us a call or uh, drop us an email. So all details are on the website, whitecobalt.com. Um, uh, you're on your LinkedIn, I guess, LinkedIn and all the other well. socials. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Perfect. So yeah, yeah, I do encourage you guys to reach out to Steve. He's a really interesting guy, an amazing journey. And um, yeah, it's been a great honor to have you on the show. So thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you. Cheers.